Okay, welcome back. This is the uh, final part. I think we just got cut off uh, the final part of part two, but there was nothing uh, incredible there, just letting you know there's going to be a third part. Um, so what we're going to do now is just um, give you a run-through of the summing up of the judge. And um, it basically went like this. They went out for probably no more than seven minutes and then came back in and went through the charges. The license could not be in dispute, um, so that was revoked. Uh, sorry, the, the license had not been uh, uh, invalid. It was a mistake on behalf of the DVLA. So this the judge accepted and uh, the barrister uh, acceded to from the Crown Prosecution Service. On the other charges, though, um, they were all upheld on the basis that, on, as regards to failing to stop, the judge said that I would have seen the lights and that I had been given more than ample opportunity to, uh, to pull over. And so, unfortunately, with it not being a jury trial, for the jury to uh, assess the questions of fact, the judge, acting as the arbiter of both the law and fact, decided that um, the case was to be, um, um, or showed that charge was to be uh, upheld, and I was found guilty of that. Uh, resisting arrest, um, the judge also said that the motorhome, my camping car, where I lived, was not a dwelling, and was not a private dwelling house, or home. This uh, obviously goes flies uh, directly in the face of uh, obvious facts and the reality of the fact that anything from a tent to a bus shelter uh, can be someone's home uh, if that's where they're living or having to, uh, having to exist. So that's quite a contentious point. The things that I didn't um, manage to cover in the trial because to be quite honest uh, there were 12 people in the court um, and there was just myself. We had the judge, the two magistrates sitting either side, there was a lady that was brought onto the bench for the summing up, there was then the court recorder, so called, there was the clerk of the court, there was the barrister for the Crown Prosecution, there was the solicitor for the Crown Prosecution, there were the two police constables, or the DC and the police constable, and uh, for one period at the end, there was a security officer from MITE, M-I-T-I-E, brought in uh, basically to, uh, to check that I had no recording instrument or equipment on me as I actually left the court, but I was unaware of that at the time. The judge, therefore, um, then addressed the point of the insurance and maintained that um, the three pieces of uh, one-ounce gold that I had lodged with the court of record were, uh, were only meagre uh, tokens and wouldn't have been enough even to cover a very minor or insubstantial um, um, civil liability claim. However, what was brought up in the court by the barrister itself, his himself was the fact that there is um, the availability of lodging and amount of uh, money at the um, Royal Courts of Justice in the High Court which used to be 50,000, and over the last, I think, five years ago, the amount was increased to 500,000 to cover insurance. So the statement was made also that I brought this up, that you don't have to have a certificate of insurance necessarily registered on, registered on the police national computer. It is enough to provide insurance elsewhere. And I was maintaining that under... Uh, uh, an honourable open contract in a court of record that I had lodged enough to, to satisfy the vast majority of claims. The vast majority of claims in the UK, uh, uh, the average claim for a motor car, private motor vehicle repair, is in the region of £2,400. The average annual premium is around between £400 and £600 a year. So let's call it 500. I'd actually deposited uh, in the region of five, five and a half thousand pounds uh, in gold, real money at a court.
record of record. So at £500 uh, a year, that represents, with a little bit of maths, let's say eight years of premium deposited up front. Also, therefore, on the basis that in any accident, there will be a 50-50 chance of you being in the right, therefore the money that I'd placed in real money, in gold, was more than adequate to meet most claims. Um, however, these, these uh, points were never able to be discussed uh, because the judge was also saying that common law really wasn't of any place in, uh, in the court to be talked about that day because Parliament, any parliamentary act or statute had the right to alter the common law. Um, so he was basically saying everything had to proceed under the statute law. Um, at that stage I was really beyond arguing anymore uh, because it, it, the court case went on for just over probably an hour uh, and uh, it was quite tiring. Uh, the one thing we do obviously need to address though at the f further point is, um, is support in court because there's a lot of energy and it's quite overwhelming when you have the weight of the British jurisdiction system staring at you when you've got very little support or backup. And my conclusion with this is that when we go into the court as free men, we have less uh, protection than, should we say, the most heinous criminal that could ever walk into a court, but him walking in with a so-called barrister to defend him and a lawyer to represent him. Because from what I can see, the statement to me, in effect, off the record is that this movement has got to be crushed, it's got to be, uh, have the air sucked out of it, and there is no, there's no way at all that they will play fair, they will meet you halfway, that they will discuss any principles of Magna Carta, common law, natural law, natural justice, the right of man to self-determination, and in principle what they're saying is, you can say whatever you want, but we will charge you as we wish, we will deal with you as we wish, and you've got no barrister, you've got no lawyer or solicitor or other uh, representation. There was no one in the court from the press or the media. They can do whatever they want. So, what we've done now is, I know there's lots of YouTube uh, information out there on so-called free man victories with maybe parking tickets in the lower courts, in the magistrate's court. So what we've done now is we've escalated it to Crown Court and the next place we're going is for a jury trial in Crown Court or to the Court of Appeal because we have to bring this into the limelight so more and more people can understand it and see it and for honour's sake uh, please start discussing it. Um, I had uh, in the court uh, also the, the, the uh, DVD conversation or the recorded conversation that was made at the side of the road with um, Policeman uh, Dean Siggers. So that might be of interest for people to go over that and see if there's anything in there that uh, they thought was interesting around about 1 minute 35. Um, so that's really it. That's the summary now. So I'd like to say thank you for listening. There'll be further updates coming soon. Don't forget to look at the, um, the blog spot uh, and also um, the uh, Facebook page. And uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Keep in touch, there's more to come and the documents will be uploaded onto the website um, very soon. Sorry for the delay, we're just having some technical difficulties coordinated. So once again, Peter of England, thanks you very much. Till next time.